Um, now you want to be careful because there's this common way in which you can sometimes see this, and I'm just doing the Ghostbuster sign here. Um, make sure you know that's not the right way to do it. Because I want you to ask yourself this question. Um, if you say, if it rains this now, then the streets are wet. The streets are wet. Therefore, if it rained just now, you ask yourself that question, can premises one and two be true and the conclusion false? Yes. Right? Because that we're just taking for sake of argument, number one is true. Um, we could get picky with it, right, and point out ways in which it might not be. There might be invisible awning. Let's just say, generally speaking, if it rains and it downpours, <laughs> then the streets are wet. Now you walk out and you see wet streets. Does it follow from that that it rained just now? The answer is no, because it could be a busted water main. There, notice, premise one would be true, premise two would be true. The streets are, in fact, wet. They're not wet in virtue of a rainstorm. They're wet in virtue of a busted pipe. So uh, three could be false. So when we do that validity test, right, we would say um, this could be true. This could be true. Can we imagine any way in which the conclusion is false? Yes. Therefore, it's invalid. Now, is this sound? Why not? Yes. It must be valid to be sound. So even if it did just rain, or sorry, even if the streets are wet and whatever, uh, it still wouldn't be sound. If, if you see that it's invalid, your job is done. It's unsound. Because validity, as you look on the screen, this sort of taxonomy there. Um, right, so we're starting again as basic, basic, very basic. We're saying just groups of statements. Some of them are not actual arguments. Sometimes we have traditional claims or illustrations or whatever. Those are not arguments. But if we have an argument, if the question is statements that are arguments, we have premises that are trying to support some sort of conclusion. We go to evaluate those arguments. Go to the deductive channel. Start says the, the, the deductive side of it. We ask, is it valid? We're asking whether or not those premises, the truth of which, if they're true, guarantee the truth of the conclusion. If the answer is no, then it's unvalid, sorry, invalid and unsound as a result of that. Is valid, then we have to ask the next question. And it could be that crazy a crazy sort of uh, argument. That's valid, but valid isn't saying much. All valid is saying is that it's set up properly. Right? You, you, there's lots of really terrible valid arguments. It should not believe the conclusion. Um, why? Because they have false premises. Then we would want to check to see whether or not the premises are true. Premises are true, then it's sound and false otherwise. Now this has a name too. This is called affirming the consequent. And that is a uh, what we call a formal fallacy. The Q in this this is a conditional claim. Q is the consequent. P is called the antecedent. We are affirming the consequence. Now, there's another one that goes something like this. Put it on the board here. If P, then Q. Not P, therefore not Q. That also is a fallacy. It could be to say something like, if it rains just now, then the streets are wet. It did not rain just now. Therefore, the streets are not wet. But again, if uh, just because the streets are not wet, I'm sorry, just because it didn't rain just now doesn't follow that the streets are not wet. So 
it could be the butt for that. This one is called Denying the Antecedent. So in this case, the argument was, if it rained just now, then the streets are wet. And it's to say, it did not rain just now. If it does, uh, well, one of two things, depending on what you're asking here. One would be to say, then the premise is false. It's invalid, unsound anyways, but the premise is false too. We could just sort of keep on the problem here. But if we were to then change the argument, follows Q, then we're back to modus ponens. We've got a good argument, valid argument. And if it did in fact rain, then it's a sound argument. Okay. Again, some people, this just clicks for your board right now. You're thinking, man, it's going to get on to something. Other people say, barely struggling to follow any of this because it's like once you start doing the negations especially it's kind of hard to follow what one is saying and so on. So everybody's at different spots here. I'm trying to go slow to sort of catch everybody. But um, but um, do you know best way to do it is honestly what Robert just did is just say, okay I'm a little lost. Can you help me here? What if this? Um, just work with this stuff, think about it, do examples and you get you gain facility with it. Um, yeah. Now we do have uh, a logic advanced logic class. You can always take that if you really want to go get that for this. Um, that's because we have two. One's called critical thinking, and the other is called intermediate logic. Yeah, um, again, I just want to make you a little dangerous. That's my goal. Okay, let's turn to non-deductive standards now. Okay, so this is the argument we had earlier that we said it's a pretty good argument actually. That's some trouble. He, he most likely committed the murder. But likely is really the key word there. What you want to notice is this is in uh, sorry, yeah, invalid by deductive standards. It has failed deductive standards. Why? Because we can imagine the premises being true and the conclusion false. It'd be extraordinary, right? Because, I mean, there's a lot of evidence mounting to Smith here. But he could be innocent, even though he's confessed, even though people have testified to this, even though his fingerprints are on the murder weapon. What we would say about this argument is that it's a non-deductively strong or argument, or we would just say strong for short. Like non-deductively strong. It's despite the fact that it's invalid. That's why I say invalid doesn't mean, need to mean that it's all bad. Um, it doesn't meet deductive standards, but we turn to non-deductive standards. And this is a good argument. I mean, this is a really good argument. Smith's going down, most likely. It's strong. What do we mean by, I'm sorry, then the, the corollary of soundness is cogency now. If the premises are true, sorry, that should say, if it's strong and the premises are true, then it's a cogent argument. Again, it's those two things. So this, this is going to be much like sound, uh, uh, deduct, deductive standards. It's going to require two things, cogency, that is, true premises and a strong argument. And we'll, we'll define these here in a second. Strength. If the premises are true, then the conclusion is likely to be true. Not guaranteed. Right? Remember, validity was guaranteed, necessarily, must be. We don't have that kind of support, so to speak. You've got likelihood. You've got probabilities. Said somewhat differently, the truth of the conclusion is not guaranteed, it's just made likely so long as the premises are true. Okay. 
what do I mean by cogency? Two things again. The argument is strong and the premises are true. So if an argument is not strong, we say the argument is weak. If it's if it's not cogent, we say it's uncogent. Just for a matter of knowing the terminology. Now it's either strong or weak, or it's cogent or uncogent. Okay, now um, when it comes to strength, just like the term suggests, and this is different from validity. Validity, it's either is or it isn't. The house is either wired properly or it's got some disconnect somewhere. Um, the strength, it comes in degrees. And I mean, one thing I want to say generally about non deductive standards is they're way messier. They're way kind of like, well, is how strong is this, right? Um, to what degree does this make this, you know, does this premise make this conclusion strong? A lot of that's way more arguable rather than the logical sort of structure of it all uh, when it's valid. So non deductive standards get the, it gets a good bit messy. But check this out. All previous popes have been men. Therefore, probably the next pope will be female. What do you think? How would you evaluate that in terms of non-deductive standards? This isn't meant to be a trick question. I'm sorry about that. Weak. Thank you. Okay. Does that premise make likely the conclusion? Not at all, right? I mean, unless there's some other reason why, you know, they alternate, you know, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's radical. But but as far as the premise is concerned, and typically the way we do it is we, we only have the premise. When somebody presents an argument, you're evaluating the argument, you've got to evaluate what you have in terms of premises. And so what we've got in terms of premise seems to have no bearing, seems to not make likely at all that the next pope will be female. So this is a weak. You think about this one. All previous presidents, U.S. presidents, let's say, have been female. Therefore, the next president will be female. Strong. Right? A lot of students say, oh, that's weak. Right? But no, it's not weak. Technically, it's non-deductively strong. It's uncogent. Why? Yes. Good. This premise is I mean, the premise is false, sorry. Uh, all previous presidents have been female. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so um, we're moving through these different, uh, if they're good arguments, they're going to be good non-deductively. The first one we said is clearly weak, therefore uncogent. Second uh, set here when we evaluate it, it actually, if the premise were true, the conclusion would be somewhat likely at least. So it's strong, non-deductively strong, but the problem is one is false. As it happens, right, none of the previous U.S. presidents have been female, so clearly one is false. Um, there, I know what I know what you're like for just a second getting tripped up on. And that's sometimes we're sort of imagining possible universes and things like that. But when we ask for the truth of premises, right, we're asking, we're asking about our universe. We're asking about our world. We're saying, is this premise actually true? We're not imagining it to be true or false or anything like that at that point. When we ask for the truth or falsity of premises, we're saying, as an actual matter of fact, what do you say about one? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I sort of snuck in there, U.S. president. Um, but again, if chances are, when, if somebody were to be making this in our context, meaning like here, they probably mean U.S. president. But not always. I mean, they could mean the presidents of 
a company or the institution or whatever. So if, I mentioned this a couple of you earlier, but, uh, or at the break, if you come away from this discussion with a sort of hair trigger to always say, well, it can't really mean that. You know, tell me that I'm, I've done my work, right? I, I'm happy. Um, so I want you to be picky on these to some degree. You know, on one hand. On the other hand, some of them we're going to just have to let slide as saying, well, if I, this is how we would say it, something like, if I meant, if the person giving this argument meant the U.S. president, president of the United States, then the premise is false. Okay. And somebody say, well, I didn't really mean that. Okay, then we have to. What country are you talking about? Well, somewhat. But also, I'm. Yeah. I guess they have to be very specific. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, because if, if the claim was, well, still it would be false, but if if what we meant by premise one here was all previous presidents of any sort whatsoever, you know what I'm saying? Uh, still it's false because all it would take is one male president of something, and the president of the chess club would do, you know, or something like that. Um, much less president of the United States, president of Southwestern, and so on. So, but what you're putting your finger on is the difference of language, which we're forced to do to communicate to each other, statements. You have a statement in mind. I mean, whatever you're claiming, and you might be claiming something ridiculous, like all U.S. presidents have been female, or you might be claiming all presidents of any sort whatsoever, right? But Typically, typically we have some statement in mind that doesn't suffer from the ambiguities and vagueness of other languages. Yeah. So that's why I say in communication, we. Uh, so I just had a few things pop up. I don't know if they came up when you were speaking, Chris, but I just closed them because it's something about Zoom, which we're not using, right? Okay. That's what's coming. Yeah. I know that's coming. Um, typically, right, we, we really do often have to push in to say, well, what do you what do you mean by that language? Like, what's the statement that you have in mind? Right, this is marriage. Right? How, how, I mean, getting clear on, we might use language very, very differently, and it's and it's a real task. Uh, to sort of push in and say, well, what do you, what do you have in mind? Then? Right. Um, now again, sometimes this doesn't go well in um, <laughs> when it's when it's an argument or a, or a real disagreement. At least it doesn't go well if my wife and I want to say, well, technically, you know, that kind of stuff. So, but we do need to push in and, and understand what the statements are that people are using language to try to. And again, this is not, don't think of this as only in debate setting. We're not only giving arguments when we're, when we're debating somebody of a different viewpoint. Um, this might be just us formulating the argument for ourselves. And we still, in that case, want to have valid and sound arguments if we can. Otherwise, strong and cogent arguments. Okay, check this out. Notice the last five presidents were male. If we were saying U.S. president, therefore the next president will be male. Somewhat strong, right? Notice this is stronger. And this is the point of it, strength comes in degrees. We say here's another here's another argument. All the previous U.S. presidents have been male. Therefore the next one. And again, arguably that's 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 setting even a greater precedent. Now again, you might. Put some new premises in there, add some in, and say, given that all the previous presidents have been male, it's about time for a woman. That's going to come up for the next one's a woman. So you could do that, but that's putting different premises on the table, it seems to me. And all we have here to go on is premise one. 
And the fact that we've got this really long uh, precedent of male presidents, it gives good reason to think, even better reason than the last five, to think that the next one is going to be men. That's where strength is messier. Right? It's sort of judged in terms of how strong it's actually making. And there could be differences of opinion even of how strong a claim, uh, how much a claim is supported by some other factor. Yeah. Because... Um, yeah, because I think we can make claims about the future. But you're you're right, so that um, a lot of times our, our claims are indexed to time or a time, and we don't bother to reference that. So in other words, if somebody's today talking about the winner of the Super Bowl, 99, you know, at least out of 100, they're talking about yesterday's Super Bowl. Now, they could be talking about 20 years ago, even last year, but the, the chance, it just, again, the question is not so much the language they're using, but the, the statement they have in mind to evaluate the argument, evaluate its truth. So we just, in language, again, we, you know, language is especially messy. Because we, we have ambiguities, we have vague terms, we're not very careful when we say things, typically, but especially in just casual conversation. That's why I say it doesn't always go well with my wife, because she's just trying to say something casually, and I and I go into like philosopher mode, and you know, and that, yeah, usually that ends badly for me. Um, right, uh, but that's the reality, because right when we do philosophy, we, we want to be very careful, define all our terms of the debate or, or or what we're trying to say, move. In really careful, you know, steps and so on. Whereas in casual conversation, we just sort of throw stuff out there. And we kind of need to because it's much more ambiguous. So in order to get that's right. That's right. But again, just to sort of like push on the difference of of, of um, standards here. Um, sometimes the information is not good. So though, tech, strictly speaking, yeah, if that were true, that would really support the case. But when we go in and say, is that actually true, we would say no. So the, the argument's uncogent, even though it's, you know, on its face, strong. Yeah. Now, if you say you're not going to fit in your argument, unless there's an ambiguity present. <laughs> Not typically, and typically we're not formalizing arguments about weighing and things like that. Um, but, okay, so oh, I have erased it, but um, often it goes this way, like we've been doing, just in terms of conversation, even in the philosophical literature, when you see this sort of formal, or philosophical theological literature, when you see this sort of formalized argument, you're going to see then a bunch of paragraphs after that explaining what that argument is making reference to, what it's not making reference to, the scope of various sort of uh, quantifier words and things like that, um, potential ambiguities, trying to head those off at the pass, and so on. So a lot of that work in the actual literature is done that way. But again, you know, if we're just talking about if it rained just now, we're never going to formalize that typically, right? If we do, there's something wrong with it. Um, probably don't have friends or something. No. Uh, Right, but but we're just going to be casually talking. But notice when we talk politics, we're typically casually talking. And somebody says something that you really disagree with, and you say, "Hold on, you know, what's what are your reasons for that?" And then what you what you do, what you already do, I'm arguing, is that you're judging for strength, you're, you're judging for validity, you're judging for these things already. You maybe, if this is all new to you, have not had that sort of machinery or language uh, to label it, but that's what we already do, do, right? Because if somebody says this wild claim that's based on no research, no evidence whatsoever, we're going to say, that's not, 
Well, what you're saying is that's non-deductible reach. Or if somebody says, look, if this is the case, and this is the case, then boom, this is the case. You might say, that doesn't follow. This could be the case, and this could be the case, but that's false. What, you, what you're saying without the language is that it's invalid. So, okay. Uh, so here's the full picture. Uh, okay, so you have arguments, two different standards, deductive, we've talked about non-deductive. First step is to say, is it strong or weak? If it's weak, it's uncogent for that reason. Strong, it still might be that, like the female president's argument from a minute ago, could be strong technically, so it's got a false premise, or maybe all the premises are false. And for that reason, it would be uncogent. But if it's strong and it has true premises, then it's cogent. Now, when, whenever I've talked about soundness or cogency, I've talked about the truth of premises. I've only talked about the premises. Why? Why I'm only talking about the when I say when I say when I talk about soundness, I say something like this. I say it has to be valid and have true premises. Notice I'm not saying true conclusion because I don't have to. Right? I mean that. Yeah. Right. So validity makes it such that the conclusion is going to follow from true premises necessarily, and so then validity. I'm sorry. Soundness adds to it true premises. You take validity and true premises, you've got a true conclusion. Same with cogency. Well, with cogency, uh, you, uh, sorry, with co cogency, you take strong, a strong argument, add to that true premises, you get a likely true conclusion. You get a, tr you get a conclusion that's probably true. A conclusion for which you've got really good reason to believe. Any questions on any of that stuff? Yeah. But but even if it's even if it's uh, tune out if this is confusing. I only thought you did. Um, if it's a cogent argument with a false conclusion, it's still a likely true conclusion. It's still likely. I mean, there's, there's good reason to believe it, but it just turns out to be false. Right? Um, a deductive argument is both valid and sound. On a non-deductive argument that is strong and cogent, I can still reject the conclusion yes. of that. Yes. But it's still like, I mean, if you think of probability and statistically, you know, th those don't exactly track each other. But um, in other words, there might be this statistically, you know, un improbable sort of thing that actually ends up happening. Right. Lottery cases are this way. So whenever you buy a lot, I mean, not that any of us do this, right? We make money this way, and uh, that's useful. Uh, but it, you know, Hagen, when they buy lottery tickets, um, they've got all the reason in the world to believe that it's a loser, statistically speaking. So if you formulated a, 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 a non-deductively cogent, or it would be a non-deductively cogent argument to believe that it's a loser given all the statistics and everything. But it could win. Conclusion could be false. Sort of go back to the same Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I, I mean, I don't know this for sure, but it wasn't Patriots sort of Statistically superior, they were kind of likely to win, and so on. 
Yeah. yeah. Brady. You know, that's what that meant. I got uh, Oh, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, having a backup quarterback, you know, for the Eagles and things. Um, so that it's likely they're going to lose. But it turns out. Okay. Let's do some examples. Because again, I think this is where we really should have grab hold of these things. And a lot of these are pretty cheesy, but I think they can work. So Joe says, Harry told me his grandmother recently climbed Mount Everest. <coughs> it's logically possible. Logically possible. So imagine that were to be true. Okay, no. So that's the conclusion. Premise. Well, Harry must be pulling your leg. Harry's grandmother is over 90 years old. Oh, sorry. So the, the um, claim here, what is the claim? I forget how I go over this. But yeah, what Joe is saying is the conclusion. Um, Harry's grandmother recently climbed Mount Everest. Premise. No, sorry. Uh, Sam's making the argument. So the conclusion is Harry's grandmother did not climb Mount Everest. That's that's the conclusion. The premise is Harry's grandmother is over 90 years old and can walk. What do we say about that argument? Again, conclusion, Harry's grandmother did not climb Mount Everest. Premise, why? Because she's 90 and walked away. Can you imagine the premise being true and the conclusion false? That is to say she did climb Mount Everest. Yeah, right? I mean, it's possible. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right, so what this is supposed to be, I can't remember if I say this. Okay, sorry. Tell me why. Uh, this is now putting things on my grandmother. My grandmother is over 90 years old and walks with a cane. Therefore, my grandmother did not recently climb the mountain. Valid or invalid? Can you imagine the premise being true and the conclusion false? It's a stretch of the imagination, absolutely. But yeah, it's logically possible for the premise. Because again, remember validity. It's hard to not like be just sort of distracted by how ridiculous the claims are. The validity is just the structure of the argument. So does that structure give us you know, a valid argument? No. Possible she is 90 years old and walks with a cane and just scrapes her way up the you know, mountainside or something. So it's invalid and therefore it's unsound. Now, is it strong or weak? It's invalid because we can imagine the premise being true and the conclusion false. But is this strong or weak? Is this a pretty good? It is. The premise, pretty good reason for thinking that the conclusion's true. You say, yes, it's strong. I'm sorry. I think I probably didn't say this, but yeah, it's strong, right? Because, look, if she's 90 and walks with a cane, it's good reason to think that she didn't climb Mount Everest. She did not. Yeah. Does no? It's more like. Does the premise entail the conclusion? Though? Or do, the way I w want you to think of it is, does the premise make it likely? Does it support it? Is, it pro is the conclusion probably true given the premise? And I think here, yeah, right? OK. I th again, I think I tripped you up because I, I wasn't saying that. Is it strong versus? Yeah, that's why I say it's messy. It's sort of like intuitively, does this seem to suggest that it's you know likely the case? Yeah, um, yeah, or, or you're saying it's like literally doesn't seem to 
kind of dense there, but it does that. Yeah. I think you would say it's weak in that case. Um, people don't, I mean, somebody might say, look, this just doesn't support it either. Because usually when it doesn't support it, but it doesn't necessarily count against it, it's a little bit weak. We, but remember, it's a, what we're saying is weak is the argument. Maybe that will help. Too. We're not saying the premise necessarily is weak. We're saying the relationship between the premise and the conclusion is a weak one. So if it's indifferent, 50-50, then it, I think you'd still call it. All right, uh, let's keep pushing on here. So if there's evil in the world, and an all-good God does not exist, there is evil in the world, therefore an all-good God does not exist. First of all, validity, do you think it's valid or invalid? Now this one's only a little tricky. I think I say this up. Yeah, this is valid. Again, try to imagine the premise of anything true and the conclusion false. The conclusion is false here. One of these premises is wrong. It's valid, but unsound. Wouldn't be. Right, I see this. Um, so we're going to say, but what do we have to say? We've got to say one or the other, or maybe both of these premises are false. What are we going to say? I would go with one. Especially if you're in a town, I, I don't think telling somebody there's no evil in the world, uh, right? When they've just gone through a terrible situation, terrible tragedy, um, it seems obviously the case that there's evil in the world. So, all, the problem of evil honestly turns on one. So it's unsound. Now, the only thing that's a little tricky about this, I think I say this here. No, I'm not. Um, Think of two there. There's evil in the world. Oh, sorry, that's just state motor form. That's motor form. Motor form. Sometimes the negations get a little tricky. Oh, that's what I was going to say. It's in the premise, there's the God does not exist. But just think of that whole thing as Q. So if P, there's evil in the world. Then Q, what's Q? An all good God does not exist. Two is just P, and then the conclusion is therefore Q. No? Um, no. Remember, validity is if the premise is true. There's an if there. It isn't, it's not to say that they are true. That's soundness. Validity is just to say that if the premises, think of it this way, if the premises turn out to be true, the conclusion will have to be true. Sorry? Okay. The validity, you can have false, you can have a valid argument with false premises. Like this one for the atheist. As well as the rain. Remember, it didn't rain outside, but that was a valid argument. It had a false premise. It was a valid argument. But yeah, see, and what this is nice, of, you know, what this does, is it clarifies what we should do in responding to the problem of evil or responding to an atheist that's raising this argument. It's trying to say an all good God does not exist. You say, okay, what's your argument? And they give you this argument. Now, it won't do to just say, hey, three is false. Okay? Because it's kind of not, of course you think three is false. Now you got it, because it's a valid argument, our discussion can center on where the problem is. And the problem, I want to say, we should concede that there's evil in the world. The Christian picture predicts that there's, I mean, it actually explains that there's evil in the world. Atheism, not so much, right? It's hard to figure out what it means to say that there's evil in the world. 
But I can concede two, that's fine, right? I think that's probably right. But to say that there being evil in the world means that there's no God, that's where we're going to have a discussion. Let's talk about that. Right? Well, I think one is true, I think it's the reason. So typically the way we do it is we start with deductive standards. We say, is it valid or invalid? If it turns out to be invalid, our job's not done because all non-deductively cogent arguments are strictly speaking invalid. Right, so if we're on that other side of it and it's a good argument, non-deductively speaking, it will strictly speaking be invalid. Okay, so then we, we start with validity, see if we can do that validity test. If the premises are true, does it entail that the conclusion has to be true or could it be false? If it could be false, then it's invalid. We switch over to non-deductive standards and say, but does this premise uh, make likely the conclusion? Does it give us good reason to believe the conclusion? If so, it's strong. And then we can ask, does it, uh, is the premise actually that's kind of the way it, it shakes out. Yeah. Mr. Hera? Yeah, that's right. That's a good thing. Jump over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Okay. Mankind is releasing large amounts of CO2 and other gases into the atmosphere. Uh, two, the global temperatures have steadily risen. Different metrics for this, but let's just say it's two. Therefore, mankind is responsible for global warming. So, invalid, right? Because again, remember, validity is just asking, let's assume those are both true. Could it be, could three be false? And yes. Because right, it could be that we're releasing all this CO2 and all this stuff. It could be the case that the global temperatures have risen, but these have nothing to do with man. And that man is not responsible for this. So clearly invalid. Is it a strong argument? Oh, we'll let that be a political discussion to figure out. I, I would want to say as state, I think what you said is that it's weak because it seems to need some sort of connection here. Right? We need to see make it strong, we would have to see why releasing large amounts of CO2, you know, leads to um, the, the rise in the temperature. You gotta have one and two connected. This isn't about that, is it? It's about connected. Okay. It's set up. That's already made. Right. Right. Nothing entirely. Right. And that's why I'd say, on its face, again, kind of as stated, it's a weak argument. But could it be made strong? That's what I'll leave to your political discussion. That's right. That's right. I'm thankful to be in here. Okay, this one you're going to have to stare at a little bit. Steve? Steve got up early from work, then he would have walked to the game. Steve drove to the game, which is to say he didn't walk. So just keep that in mind. Drove to the game. Conclusion, therefore, Steve did not, did not get off work early. Valid or invalid? But that's good. You think about it as if P then Q. So number one is if P then Q. What's two? P, two would be not walk to the game. Not Q. Good. Therefore, conclusion is not P. Is that valid or invalid? Valid. Good. That's just modus tollens. If P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. That's why I say, if you can, like, 
memorize those, those argument forms, um, you know, and spot and then spot them. Because that's when I was first starting out, I always had to sort of figure out, okay, is this modus ponens or not? Like, is it set up where it's if p then q? And I would put the little p's and q's in there. Is it p and therefore q? Or is it say q, therefore p, that would be invalid? Right? Or is it modus tollens that says uh, not q, therefore not p? Then it's valid, but if those are switched, again, it would be. We work it out. We think and get through. Um, so we say, yeah, valid. And again, is this sound? I mean, some of these, and I haven't made this point yet, even though we've done a few yet. Does it sound? Well, I don't know. I just don't know. But who knows? Right? Are these premises true? I don't know who's true. Um, <laughs> I just made them up. But there's really no sense in asking if it's sound. Yeah, for sure. So we're really kind of trying to spot validity here. And, you know, assuming information to that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Michelangelo painted the Mona Lisa, then he's a great painter. Michelangelo is a great painter. Therefore, Michelangelo painted the Mona Lisa. So again, try to put the P's and Q's in there. The P then Q. Two is Q, not P. Then it should be P if it's invalid. It's invalid. Right? Because even if Michelangelo painted the Mona Lisa, and for that reason he's a great painter, um, just because he's a great painter, premise two, doesn't make it the case that he did in fact paint the Mona Lisa. Just he did not in fact paint the Mona Lisa. Um, therefore, unsound. And that's that's what's kind of interesting about this one, is the premises are actually true. Well, the claim in one would be if he did paint the Mona Lisa, he'd be a pretty good painter. <laughs> if he had. Two is to say he is a great painter, which he was, of course. But the conclusion is false. That's a little interesting that the premises are actually true, but it's an invalid argument, so it's a bad argument. Bill Clinton is president and he lives in the White House, that's not right. Bill Clinton is not president. True. Uh, conclusion, Bill Clinton doesn't live in the White House. Invalid again. It's the same reason, right, I think. All right. We almost had it such. <laughs> it was almost the case, though. I know, I know. Again, the premises are true, but the um, actually the conclusion is true too. So here we have a case where the premises are true, the conclusion is true, but given the structure of it, it's a bad argument. As I say, you got you really have to be have facility with all these things. To evaluate an argument well. These happen to all be true, they just don't all make it true. They happen to be true. All right, what do you think of it, this one? Either a conservative or a liberal will win the next presidential election. Conservative, I might not agree with you, but okay, the conservative will not win. Therefore, a liberal will win the next presidential. So it's in effect saying you got these two options. One of these isn't going to happen, therefore this one will. Yeah. 
hopefully, and hopefully. Right now, so. Yeah. As stated, no, you're right. You're right, actually. I that's what I say. Though, though it's a rare breed these days, right? Because we're so polarized. A moderate could one that doesn't identify either as liberal or conservative. Now, of course, the conservative hopes to be false as well, but you know, one and two are at least trusted. But it is valid. It's actually it's called a disjunctive syllogism, and that goes like this: P or Q. Uh, typically, it's not P, so it could be either not P or not. Uh, so therefore, Q. Uh, disjunctive. Syllogism. So the order, whichever you just deny one of these. So the, one is supposed to be completely exhaustive. So you're giving P or Q. And those are the options. And you say this option, or it could be P, Q, R, S. And you rule out QRS, one's left over. That's the conclusion. But again, we would say one is false because there's clearly more options. Hopefully, two. If you're sincere. Yeah. 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 So that's valid but unsound. Now, I'd change it slightly. No, I did not. Okay. Did I? Ah, here's what I need to say. Either conservative or liberal will win the next. So that's all the same. Um, oh, I'm just making the point that even if you're conservative, right now I've switched it to be conservative. And you should still think that's unsound. Guys, okay, come on. Yeah, we're talking about arguments here. But once a slight change, we can improve this argument. Now it is more specific, more wordy. Explaining. Given the polarization in the United States, it's likely the case that either conservative or liberal will win the presidential election. That seems true, right? I mean, it's, you know, chances are for a moderate to get in there. It's really difficult. So let's hope for two. Well, for conservative. Uh, therefore, it follows from that. Notice the conservatives will likely win. Because what I'm saying in one is it's likely the case that conservative liberal. Um, that's still deductively valid, even though I've got the word likely in there. <laughs> yeah. so. I don't I don't get political much, but here we go. Your question is off the spectrum. That's right. <laughs> okay, here's another semi political one we can have. Uh, the resurgence party candidate is 90 points ahead in the polls. No one in the history of the world has ever been this far ahead and lost the election. Therefore, the resurgence party candidate will win the election. Valid or invalid? That's what? Invalid, good. Because right, again, people can be way ahead and still lose the election. That's fine. But it's a pretty strong argument. Pretty good reason. Pretty good reason to think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Third party is ninety points ahead in the world has ever been this far ahead. Yeah, if we mean by likely the, the poll, the polling this year. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I might take that back. I still don't, I'm not sure that would make it a valid argument. 
we'd have to, we'd have to, we would have to, I think, I think the only thing that would follow with deductive validity that the resurgence party candidate is 97. Or if we just mean by likely going to win 90 points or less. Maybe. Because here's, here's kind of a funny thing. This is a deductively valid argument. Not a very interesting argument. All right, if, if you have P, therefore P. Because notice, you could not have this. You couldn't assume the premise is true and the conclusion is false. What's that? Uh, somewhat, but uh, yeah, yeah, you couldn't because of, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, really would be. Uh, or um, P, Q, R. Yeah. Now that might be okay for strength. I mean, strength has less to do with P's and Q's and sort of how it's arranged. Because again, this is a strong argument, but it's because we're sort of supplying uh right what being ahead in the polls likely mean um and so on i don't think so i mean because i'm trying to look at the structure of it and i i don't think we still have any kind of valid argument Right, or even the likely winner. It doesn't, that's the way to say it. It doesn't entail the likely winner. Right. Makes a strong, again, that's even a stronger case. This, this is actually kind of a, uh, an interesting thing about logic too, or, or arguments. Because oftentimes the strength will increase the less radical the claim. Is. If, if you're saying, you know, um, this is the example often used is, you know, I've witnessed um, 10,000 ravens. They're all black. Therefore, all ravens are black. That's a really strong claim because all it takes is one albino or something raven for it to be false. But if you make a less radical claim, that's a stronger argument. And that, that's, you know, again, just as you write papers and things like that, you want to be careful to not overstate the case because sometimes. Very weakened argument. If you are making a more moderate sort of claim, again, sometimes we don't want, we want the stronger claim. So I'm not saying we of course always want to moderate our claims, but if you can, and that's still sort of good enough, then that's going to likely be an even stronger argument. Okay, I hope this is right. I don't know who Joe is. If there's a Joe in the room, I'm sorry, but um, every student at Swivitz holds to the inerrancy of scripture. Joe is a student at Swivitz, therefore Joe, Joe holds to valid, hopefully sound. Now again, right, it may be unsound. It may be the case that not every student holds to the uh, And it may be the case that Joe is not a student. Right? That's Again, I just, that's one way or another, you know, that be a valid. Oh, there I say, it may, may or may not be sound, since it's possible. If that's not true. All right, questions of any sort of any of that?
Don't think that works. Not 50, but there will be some, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if I'm, yeah, if I'm making it up, I won't ask you if it's sound or unsound. If, if this argument were to show up on the exam, I would only ask you if it's valid or invalid. Uh, I might be able to come up with some. Okay. There's definitely websites around. I, I, I might be able to find, I, I used to have these links too, um, where you can, uh, they'll give you practice. I'll tell you if it's valid. <laughs> <laughs> if you have to show a word. <laughs> well, uh, let's see, how many classes do we have before the midterm? One of, one sixth? No, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I no, there'll be a, this will be a part of the exam, but not the, the whole thing. Um, and you'll have the video too, so feel free to you know sort of go through this again. Uh, the vi videos on Blackboard. And if there's something that's like I just don't get, I mean, definitely come talk to me. We can walk walk through this. I'm happy to do that. Um, it's again a lot of it's just. So I mean, honestly, it's. It maybe didn't come out clearly, or just didn't register clearly for you, or whatever. And it's just, just sort of saying, no, look, it's just got to be this, and it kind of clears the whole thing. But like that, that often happens. So, uh, please come talk to me. I'd be happy to work through some of that. Or if you're tuning in in the call, or if you're in email, it's, uh, you know, especially if one of these arguments, it's like, okay, that in my mind should be invalid, or should be valid, or something like that. Send me the argument, and I'll, I'll try to show you why. 